And I, I believe that the God that we serve can take one message from one messenger and hit you guys every different way. And so before I pray, I want you guys to also pray for me. Just say five words. Lord, put your words in him. I'm sorry, six words. I forgot the Lord. Put your words in him. That's all you have to do throughout this message. Yes? Because if the Lord puts his words in me, you guys are benefiting. There's nothing that I can do. Like the song says, not by my might, not by my power, but by the Spirit of God. And that's what we need tonight, uh, this afternoon. So let's pray. Father God, take my life and let it be. Lord, consecrate it, Lord, to Thee. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we have been talking about let's go. Yes? Let's go. It is a call to action. It is a call to action, not for us, not for the pastors, but it is a call for action for every single one in the church. So that means you and I have a responsibility. Each member has a responsibility, and for me, my responsibilities may be different than yours. <clears throat> But today, we're going to continue to see, we've been seeing the, the story unfold of Luke chapter 10. So that's where we will be today. Luke chapter 10, if, uh, verses 17 to 24. If you are there, please say, read on, pastor. I can't hear you. Okay, you guys don't want me to read, so I don't need to read, right? That's, read, Pastor. It's only you that wants me to read, brother. Can I get more excitement for the reading of the Word of God? Okay, since you want me to read. The Bible tells us the 70 return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven. This is where I got my title. Like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not Rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. At the very time he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit, he said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way well-pleasing in your sight, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wish to see the things which you see and did not see them and to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them there is something beautiful through this journey there is a easy to follow progression in the journey of the 70 have you ever been told a story um, when I was in AUP, we had to go to this thing called Voice of Youth. It's basically you spend a week or two weeks uh, ministering. It's like a kakaer here. Yes, but it's only for the students. The students have to plan it, have to pay for it, and have to do everything. Yes? And the place that we went to 
was not very exciting. It was a very boring place. We had to sleep in the, the ground. Not the ground as in this type of ground. No, it was cement. And we were, there was three foreigners. And one of my friends, he's from Ghana. <laughs> and uh, me and another, and a Sri Lankan guy. And so we were, we were just unhappy with the situation. Yes? So on the last day, we decided to go swimming in the lake. And the brother from Ghana did not help the stereotype that Africans can't swim. And so, you know, uh, we were swimming in the lake, and you can see this brother going like this, right? And so we're like, oh, this is how he swims. He was fine. And me and my other friends, we decided, you know what? I had enough of this lake. Uh, I- I'm just going to get out. So we were talking, we were just talking. And then I see from the corner of my eye, my friend going like this. And I was just like, ah, that's just him swimming. That's how he's been doing this whole time. And then slowly, as, as we continue talking, I see his hand starts to uh, sink a little bit. And I was like, I think he's sinking. I, I, I think I saved his life because I was the one who noticed first. I, you know, I think this guy is sinking. And then everyone looked, and we just, we just looked at him like, are you sure? For like a few, like 30 seconds, we were just staring at him. Not, uh, yeah, yep, yep, he's sinking. <laughs> and I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going in there. No, no one wants to go in there. So we, gotta gra- we grabbed a big stick and, you know, we pulled him out. But the reason why I tell this story is because what makes this whole entire trip memorable was that event. And for the next year or so, every time my friend preached, the one that almost drowned, he mentions that story. And the reason why this is uh, applicable right now is because imagine the 70, yeah? They, they were not supposed to take any bags. They had nothing that was supposed to be taken with them. They could have complained. They could have had certain things, you know, that, that, that was not going according to their plan. But when they come to Jesus, they said... The Bible tells us they return again with joy. Mm. I can imagine the 70 walking around wherever they were at. And they said, hey, my brother, do you have a demon? Guess what? Jesus has given me power to take away that demon in your life. You know, my sister, you know what? You, you have some issues with your body. I got you. Jesus gave me power over that too. Yeah? And they return with joy to Jesus, realizing that the devils are subject through thy name. That must be a powerful feeling. Imagine devils subject to us through thy name. The Bible never said they complained. They never talked about how tired they were. But given any one of us in the audience other than the pastor. We have to do some evangelism somewhere. We're like, ah, you know, pastor, I'm not much of an evangelism person. You know, uh, let, let's go to an orphanage. Let's go do something to minister on other people in Jakarta. You know, pastor, I'm a little tired. I don't think I, I want to do this. Yes, but the 70, the, our examples of the church should be these 70. They went without anything and they returned with joy. Not one complaint in their hearts. They said, the demons are subject to us in your name. Number one, all victories over Satan are obtained by power coming from Christ. There should have been more than one okay. And I I highlighted name here because the word for name in the Greek indicates authority. 
yes? If you guys have a church meeting, you implicate it because of the authority of the church board. By the power of the church board, this and this is going to happen. Yeah? You know, uh, so many times I talk to people like, Pastor, what, about this? What, what does this mean in the Bible? Because this pastor says this is what this means. Yeah? When we talk about theology, we, we, we talk about what the Bible is saying, we rely on the authority of another pastor, of another theologian. And so this, the word name comes with authority and power. And I, I remember when I was in a student government, whenever we would have meetings, we would spend two days planning an event, sometimes more, right? We have all of these events that we're planning, and all of a sudden, we give it to the administration, and they say no. And we had to go back, you know, guys, the administration, and there's a lot of it that happens, because of their authority, we have to say no. We have to reject this project, reject this plan, and then we have to start over. So there's something about someone's authority, and there's nobody with more authority on earth than Jesus. And Jesus, hearing all of these stories, he must have been a very proud person to hear all of the success of the people. Imagine if you were preaching one day and as a result of your preaching, many people are baptized and everyone that's hearing the sound of my voice goes outside and brings one person inside the church. You'd be like, man, praise the Lord. You'd feel a certain type of happiness because you sent these guys out. Yes, pastor? And so imagine the joy that Jesus had hearing the success of every one of these stories. Yeah? But Jesus says, his response is very interesting. Number one, he, he said, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Hmm. Satan falls. Right away, you know, I'm a very image-driven guy. So this imagery that Jesus gives of falling like lightning, for me, is very sudden. Yes? Lightning falls very quickly. There's no time limit. There's no duration of a time. When Jesus comes to your life, changes are sudden. Changes in your lives are sudden, and Christ sees and rejoices in the fall of the devil from the interest he has in the souls of men. Satan falls from heaven whenever we call upon Christ. Whatever situations you are going through, perhaps some of us here are struggling with certain finances. Perhaps some of us here are struggling with our relationships. Maybe our relationships with our parents isn't what they should be. With our children isn't what they should be. Perhaps our relationships with our boyfriend or our girlfriend isn't what it is supposed to be. The Bible tells us when we come to Jesus, when we place Jesus as the primary source of our energy, our, our desires, Satan falls from heaven like lightning. That means all of our issues, all of our troubles, all of our darkness that we are going through is gone. It should have been an amen. And the, the reason why is because there's a study. <clears throat> Do you guys know, that, have you guys ever seen this study before? No? So back in the 80s, I think, uh, to prove the, what's this called? Uh, the addictiveness of drugs, they would have mice in a park and they would give them an option, either to drink from the drug-induced uh, water or just regular water and there's nothing else in this park except for these two things and they noticed that once they, they the mice started drinking 
those types of uh, the drug-induced liquid, they would come back every so often. And they would become addicted and they would actually uh, reject the regular water. <clears throat> but then something interesting happens when there are, there's a sense of community uh, in this park. And they have a sense of belonging. They have a sense of purpose in their lives. They never wanted the opioids. They never wanted those drugs. Whenever when this option was given, whenever there, uh, this option was given and there was something to live for, they chose the water, just the regular water. And the reasoning is because we don't want, uh, if we have a purpose to live, we'll continue forward with our lives uh, without whatever addictions we battle, we'll face through it. And so for, for me, when I'm reading this, the verses that we just read, it's as if whatever situations that we are in, if there's a purpose that God has given us, we'll overcome that, uh, whatever issues that we have because God has given us the power to uh, overcome those things. Jesus has the authority to overcome any situation Satan binds you in. And then, so Christ tells us whatever, what Jesus points to in those verses is that whatever our situation, whatever our troubles, Jesus is there. The thing that Satan uses to get your heart thinking a certain type of way sometimes can be very subtle. Sometimes Satan uses, you know, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. Sometimes Satan uses your job as an excuse for why you don't come to church. Why you don't do the things that you're supposed to do. And, and one day you wake up, why do I feel so far away from God? But then, you know, we, we feel so far away from God. And when we do feel far away from God, it's like, man, I don't know how to get back to God. But Satan, uh, but the Lord tells us, just come. There's no requirements to come to him. Whatever issues you're going through, s Satan falls like heaven from lightning when Jesus enters your life. And, and I want to continue on after what happens sorry <clears throat> and what this tells me is that see jesus draws the line in the verse that the whole mission of the 70 is to preach and heal and to heal them of the destruction satan has done to separate them from god pastor sam i think the first week realized that the issue with he, uh, the, the, uh, what Jesus does when he heals people, he says, your sins are forgiven. It is because he's not healing the sickness, he's healing the sin-sick soul. Right. Yes? He's healing your connection with God. So this is how Satan falls from heaven like lightning. Satan falls from heaven like lightning because Jesus is able to... Um, draw you back to him this is the same thing that luke says again in acts 26 verse 18 he tells us when the message of god is given in the hearts of the people it opens our eyes so we can turn darkness to light and turn away from the dominion of satan to god christ knows that when we preach the uninterrupted untethered gospel it is to fly like lightning through the world and it would pull down satan's kingdom wherever it was preached when someone is riddled with disease uh, sorry when a co-worker is gossiping about you you know their issue is that they're far away from god and so you should tell them about god Sometimes when someone is hurting us, we want to stay away from them, yeah? You know what? I'm not going to go near you. Sometimes even in the church. That, there's some people that don't want to sit on this side because they know there's a certain brother or a certain sister that's sitting on this side, so I'm going to sit on that side. Am I wrong? There are some people, you know what? 
I don't want to go to that church. That brother right there is in that church. Let me go to this church where it's comfortable. Yeah? I don't want to listen to that pastor preach. That pastor is preaching and he's doing all of these things that I know. He's dividing that church, but you're not there for the pastor. You said it this morning. You're not there for the messenger. You're there for the message. Am I wrong? And so there are so many times that when we focus, and I always never understand this, why when the co uh, why we tend to avoid those that need the spiritual healing the most. And after the story of the 70 coming to Christ, saying everyone, uh, the, uh, the devil is under our authority through thy name, Jesus tells the 70, the 70 in the Bible, the 70 in Jakarta, the 70 in JCC, he tells us today that putting Jesus will shift our focus from hurting others into desiring the best for others. If our main focus is to heal the sin-sick soul, we're not going to sit on this side because that brother is there. Matter of fact, we'll sit by that brother and say, you know what, I know you're struggling. Let me pray for you. And I never understood this idea why people, why it's so hard for people to, I, I, as Pastor Sam likes to say, commercial big. I never understand why it's so hard for people to feel good about another, one another, success. It doesn't cost you anything. Yeah? Why do we have to hate on other people's success? Like, it really doesn't do anything for you to be like, hey, you know what? That brother, that sister, you know, he getting promoted before I did, and I was here five years before he was. I work harder than he does. Why is he promoted first? Like, let's, let me not go into this. <laughs> Anyways. Let's just be happy for whatever successes are in other people's lives. It doesn't cost us anything, right? And when our lives are led by desiring good for others, we look at that person and we want the best for them. We realize it costs nothing to be genuinely happy for somebody. We spend so much time worrying about others instead of being happy for them. For Jesus, when the gospel is preached properly and the Spirit touches the hearts of people, it is to remove those spiritual deficiencies in the hearts. Let's continue. After this, after Jesus tells the 70, you know what? I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He does something else to them. He gives them a bigger job, an enlarged commission after all of these things. You know what this, this enlarged commission is? Uh, this is, his name is William the Kukas Perry, the refrigerator. Because he's built like a refrigerator, they said. Imagine you're so big, you look like a refrigerator. He is uh, a defensive tackle. That's the biggest guys on the football field for the monsters of the midway, the Chicago Bears of the 1980, 1985. Yeah, and he was the biggest guy on the team and he was able to play, he plays defense, but in this game, he played offense. They, they said, you know what, he's so big, nobody's going to be able to tackle him. And so from the one yard line, all he had to do was go from here to here, but in the middle, it's very packed, right? So they said, he's going to be so strong Whoever's going to try to stop him, he's just going to pull him forward, push them forward. And so after that, he scored a touchdown, and the Bears won the game, 45 to 10. Anyways, so he played offense and defense. And what Jesus gives this mission is similar to what the William, William the Refrigerator Perry did. He played both offense and defense. Jesus gave us an offensive power. As one of our commission, he says, I'll give you the authority to tread on serpents, devils, and malignant spirits. You know what? You've been casting out demons. You'll continue to do that. 
you, you've been praying for those people to get better, you'll continue to do that, and I will continue to listen to your prayers. That, that was Jesus' promise to the 70, and that's Jesus' promise to each and every single one of us today. That we will continue to be able to tread on serpents, devils, and malignant spirits. That's our offensive power. You don't believe in the power of healing. When a friend of mine, he had stage 4 cancer, and like what you were saying, that cancer was reversed. You want to know the miracles of healing. This is the power that Jesus has given us. The power to overcome whatever uh, illness, to tread on serpents, devils, and malignant spirits. But also, he gives us a defensive power. It says, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. That means whatever the devil is trying to throw at you, if you call on Jesus, they're not going to let you be overcome. If you're serving as a leader of the church, trials are going to come. And Jesus says, if you continue to call on my name, these things are not going to hurt you. I will allow you to overcome them. That's a quite a power, yeah? And quite a promise that Jesus gives us. And so, as he continues, he gives us, he gives the 70 this larger job to continue doing it and to have the promise that nothing can hurt you. But then, he says something very interesting. He says, but, it sounds like a but what Jesus is saying uh, from the beginning. He's like, you know what? You've been doing good. I saw heaven fall from, uh, I saw Satan from, for, fall from heaven like lightning. You did this, 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 and you continue to be able to do this. But, you know, when you're, when you're in trouble with your parents, you know, when I was, I, I, I'm on live stream. My mom might, might, might watch this, so I can't tell you the story. But you know, you know when your parents are about to tell you, hey, when you're in trouble and you're, you come home with a bad grade, Yeah? And your mom looks at the grades. You know what? This is okay, but you're not going to play video games anymore. You know there's a butt coming. You, you can see her face, and you're just like, ah, Lord have mercy. Come on, mom, I want to play video games. All right, next semester, I'll get my grade up so I can continue playing video games. But Jesus says, hey, you did all of these things. You casted out demons. You're able to overcome a lot of things. You were able to evangelize Jakarta to be a Christian city. Someone should have said amen. I know I'm Asian, but I don't like begging for amens. You know, when you see an African preacher up here, you know, like, you know, this guy wants you to say amen. I know I'm Asian, guys, but hey, I love amens too. Please. Praise the Lord. Hey. <laughs> I lost my time. <laughs> anyway. So, <laughs> all right, he says, but don't rejoice. He said, you're, you're able to do all of these things. You're able to uh, preach the message of God to Jakarta. You're able to make it throughout the whole island of Java. You're able to do this, Jakarta Central. But don't rejoice in that. Don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. And I'm just like, wait, what? Imagine all, if this church is able to evangelize everyone, not, maybe not Jakarta, but in SCBD. And you would be like, hey, yeah, you know what? This is a, Jakarta, uh, the, an, a Christian area now. And God says to you, hey, this may be a Christian area, but don't be happy that it is a christian area you might be thinking wait what but pastor the elders they're all doing this how can we not be happy he says rejoice only on one thing not the things that you've done rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven this sh i struggled with this idea 
What, what does that mean? How can, if we do a lot of work for God, doesn't, won't that mean that our names are already in heaven? That's, that's what you would assume, right? Imagine being an elder in the church and going to hell. Being a vegetarian for 10 plus years and going to hell. <laughs> Imagine all of these things that you think you are doing the God, God's will and you end up burning. And I, I was pondering on this. And then I realized in Matthew 10, verse 1 and 2, Jesus gave another commission to 12 people. And the last name on the list of 12 was Judas Iscariot. It says, the one who betrayed him. It is because who, if the works that you have done, it, it, the works that you have done may be great, but if God was never in your heart to begin with, then what's the point? You missed it all. A wasted opportunity, one might say. Imagine living your life as Pastor Henry says, for 15 years as an Adventist, you were born in an Adventist family. And you're not actually Adventist. You were just born into that family, but you yourself, in your heart, is not Adventist. Imagine leading song service every single Sabbath. And there is no song service in your house. I, I said this many times before, you can't find God in church if you can't find God in your house. If God isn't in your living room, what's the point of you coming to church to find God? You've been in the faith for many, many years. And if someone asks you for a Bible study, hey, Pastor, you know what? I have a Bible study student for you. No, that's not for the pastor, that's for you. The pastor shouldn't be doing all the Bible studies. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It should be the members also giving Bible studies. Yeah? It should be the secretary of the church giving Bible studies. Also, the elder. I saw Elder Kelvin walking away. <laughs> so I, I got to catch him, you know? It should be everybody. The 70, as we have been saying, is not the pastors. It is the members sitting down behind this first row. It is you and me. I mean, it is you, not me. <laughs> Sorry. I'm used to saying you and me, right? It is them. He said, man, you know what? You guys may, mates, may have made Satan fall out from heaven you may, you may have succeeded in your mission, but don't worry about those accomplishments. Don't worry about those powers that you were given. Jesus is saying today, you have the power to minister. Jesus told us earlier, we have the power to tread serpents and spirits away. So why are you not using that power? Number one, why are you not using that power? And number two, when you use that power a lot, why are you only focused on using that power and not having God in your hearts? My brother, Rainier, summarized this lesson like this. Don't just rejoice on how God works through you for others. Rejoice on how God works for you and what he has done for you. It is a wasted opportunity, church. If Satan falls because of you, but not through you. 
It is a wasted opportunity if the people that come to Christ because you were helping them, but you are not in there. It is a wasted opportunity if you are in the church years and years, but your heart is uncommitted and your name is not in heaven. It is so sad to be a church leader and not be in heaven. You could have been doing something else with your life. If you're going to sin, at least sin the right way. Don't sin in church. <laughs> Don't be sinning while you're in church bringing other people out also. <clears throat> the story is told. I'm going to close on this story. The story is told about a young man by the name of HMS Richards. He said, as he was still in his teens, he had heard the story, uh, a, a young lady, uh, not a young, an old lady, a frail old lady, stand here, very frail. She was probably in her 60s or 70s, preaching without a microphone, without <clears throat> any devices that would um, make her voice larger. She was just standing, preaching the word of God. And he was some rows back, and he says, that lady had a voice so powerful, despite her frail age and her frail figure. And... Mr. Richards would say, when she prayed, she got on her knees and she didn't pray like we would pray. She didn't say, our father. She said, my father. And for HMS Richards, that moment in her prayer when she says, my father, was so powerful because he realizes that whatever power she had comes from a personal relationship with God. This lady at that time, 60, 70 years old, her name was Ellen White. And imagine being that old and still preaching the word of God. Some of us were only 20, 25. We have... Never preach. No, let the pastor do it. But anyways, I digress. It is for Jesus. He says, don't rejoice in your works. Because he tells us in Luke 17, 10, if someone praises you for your works, he tells us what to say. He says, tell them I am but an unprofitable servant. I have only done that which God has commanded. For Jesus, the most important part of our walk with Him is a personal relationship with Him. Personal relationship where we can call God my Father, my God. That's how close Ellen White's relationship with God was my father if there are some of you here this afternoon you know your relationship with God is not as close as you'd like it to be and as we close for prayer you want to commit yourself to God you know what Lord I have been doing many things outside of the church but I want to commit myself to you again and if you want to commit and you want to do things I, I believe there are things uh, in the back, yeah? There are cards in the back that you can sign up if you want to do other things for the church. You're welcome to do so. But if you just want to commit yourself silently to God, I want you to stand right now <clears throat> as we pray.
perhaps you haven't been that committed that you should be. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we know there is nothing in this world like seeing Satan fall from the hearts of men. The problem is, Father, when Satan falls and then a few years later you fall from our hearts. We lose that commitment, that fervor that you gave us in the beginning. My brothers and my sisters stand before you this afternoon asking you to once again give us the power to commit to you. That we may commit to you and may our names be recorded in heaven. May we be able to converse with angels and have angels ask us, how did you know it was God's voice? Because of your relationship with us. And so strengthen that now, Father, and allow us to rejoice in knowing that our names will be recorded in heaven. This is our prayer, Father God, and we ask that you allow it to be our experience. For we ask in Jesus' mighty name, let all of God's people say,